we, we honor that. So, um, yeah. Well, um, so we have been doing a series as we approach the day of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. Um, and um, it is coming up next week. It takes place um, after Easter. And so, uh, so we've been doing a series just kind of focusing on the Holy Spirit and His activity. By the way, it's a him, not an it. And he's not a bird, even though we have a cool animation. That's cool, right? But, um, but uh, you know, he's not a bird, um, but uh, he is God, the Holy Spirit. And it's right that we press in to get to know God, the Holy Spirit. Um, we are a Christian church. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so, um, so we've been talking about the Spirit's activity in various ways, how He's active and present with us, empowering us in life and in ministry. Um, so that's what we've been talking about. That is online uh, the previous weeks, and uh, <clears throat> we'll be wrapping that up, I think, uh, next week. Um, but uh, unless you've been, you know, living in a cave, uh, we, we had another terrible tragedy happen this week, didn't we? And I'm not going to get into all the stuff, um, but it does leave people with some frustration and confusion when these things happen, uh, the school shooting that happened in Texas. Um, here's something that I think that we need to remember. Do you remember uh, how a few weeks ago, last month, I did a, a short series on how we look at the world, we need to look at the world through the lens of God is real and His Word is true. And, and it's a biblical worldview that we have. And so we have to understand that we coexist with evil in this world. Um, evil's here, evil happens. Uh, and it's not all mental health. Mental health is a real thing. But sometimes it's just evil and demonic. And we will coexist with evil in this world until um, we get to heaven. And, or until the Lord comes and, um, and the, you know, the full day of the Lord is established. And, but at, as we get closer to that day, the Bible tells us it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse. And so, you know, people mock Christians when we say, hey, we're going to be praying for you. Hey, we're, we're praying. Um, because they don't understand the power of prayer. They think it more in terms of wishful thinking. Um, they think of it as fairy tales and rainbows um, and sometimes people who say sending positive thoughts your way, that's essentially what that is. But I want you to understand, and we're going to focus on it this morning, that there is power in prayer. We're not talking to the air. We're talking to the God who has bridged the distance and built relationship with us through the cross of Jesus Christ. And there is power in prayer. And so we're going to focus on that uh, today. But... But I do know, I understand people's frustrations and I understand they want action. I just need you to understand that prayer is action. Yes. The most powerful, influential action that you can do. I'm not saying there's not other things that may need to happen. I'm not saying that. Um, you know, when Jesus learned of the brutal murder of his half-cousin, um, John the Baptist, he didn't grab his AR. Uh, he didn't sign a petition. He didn't rush to Facebook to debate. Uh, he, he went to, he departed to a solitary place to grieve and to pray. And so, you know, what we're talking about today and next week is how to go to a deeper place with God so that your prayers and your ministry are powerful and effective. So next week is Pentecost Sunday. Um, it's often referred to as the birth of the church. It was a wonderful day. It was a wonderful day. Um, you know, the Spirit of God came, and, and He filled all the believers in the upper room, and there was this visible sign, uh, tongues as of fire settling on the believers. Uh, it was a visible sign, just like in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came to the temple and the glory of God settled, there was a visible sign of His presence and His power, and that sign showed up again on the day of Pentecost because the new temple was established, which are the people reborn in the Spirit of God as the collective body of Christ. The Spirit of God had come to settle in the new temple 
just like he did in the old temple. There's purpose for these things that you read. But of course, the, perhaps the most controversial and misunderstood part of this amazing day is associated with the giving of gifts to his church, in particular, the gift of tongues. And so, you know, tongues is not the only gift. Some people act like it is. Uh, tongues is not the only gift, but it is the most misunderstood and misrepresented gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about it. Because I like to do that. I want to I want to tackle these things. I don't want to be afraid and pull back. I want us to focus on it. Um, and so we're going to just, we're going to let this be our guide. Isn't that a good idea? And so we want a biblical view, a biblically faithful view. We want to look at what the Bible says about it. Because I'm stunned uh, how people have all, have all kinds of ideas and have heard all kinds of things about this gift uh, even though those who don't know Jesus, even, you know, don't, they don't know Jesus, they don't attend church, but they have all kinds of opinions about this gift. You know, everybody seems to have an opinion or has some kind of Google doctorate on the subject. You, you know, and well, I, I Googled this, mister. And, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's great, but we're going to go to the source, right? And so... What I want to do today is I want to interpret this, this gift to you today. We're going to be interpreting tongues. And I'm not talking about the gift of interpretation of tongues. I want to be interpreting the gift of tongues, what it means today, what it looks like, what the Bible says about it. We're going to look at some obje objections and stuff like that. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's actually a lot of, of scholarly work on this gift, even though it's still a very experiential thing. Um, there's still mystery, uh, just like with God. If anybody ever says they've totally figured out God, then just walk away from them because they're lying. Um, God can't be put in your box. Um, so, but, but I think that we here at Creekside have developed a strong enough community where we can look at difficult subjects and sometimes scary subjects with some vulnerability. And so my hope is that as we move forward, we will have a community that is committed to worshiping God with our intellect as well as experientially with our hearts. Yes. You see, there's a lot of imbalance in the church. Um, it, it, I think that it's easy. On one side, you have people who are very comfortable in the intellect and they want to stay there uh, because the other stuff scares them. Uh, and so they, they, they learn the doctrine, they learn the scriptures, they, and that's all good, I'm not saying that. Uh, but on the other side, you'll have people who like, are very focused on like, I don't care about all that, I just want to feel the presence of God. I just like the goosebumps, you know, I'm here for the goosebumps. Um, can I tell you that both extremes are, are not faithful to what this shows us? Amen. That... Um, Following Jesus is something that we worship God with our intellect, which is called theology, and we also worship God experientially with our hearts. In fact, I would say with a biblical defense that you cannot be a follower of Jesus unless you have experienced Jesus because he talks about the new birth. And that's just not an intellectual nod to a principle that is an experience that happens. Yes. Feel me? Yes. Amen. Okay. Amen. <laughs> All right. You know, somebody, and I get it. I, I, get, I get the hesitation. I get the fear. There's so many negative examples out there, so many terrible, just, I just, what are you doing, you know? And, and I get that. I've seen those just like you've seen those, and I pull back from that as well. Uh, in fact, my first night here interviewing, uh, there was a Q&A session. Um, those are fun, but um, <laughs> aren't Q&As great? <laughs> she did one on Wednesday. Um, I remember somebody uh, came up to me, and I, I didn't remember who it was, but um, they, they came up and, and just kind of with a declarative, I don't want charismatic chaos around here. I said, well, okay, <laughs> 
I'm like, well, neither do I. I don't, you know, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I'm saying I believe in the gifts of God, but I don't want charismatic chaos. But, you know, there, there, it, but it kind of gave me a clue because there's a title of a, of a very smart man um, by the name of Charismatic Chaos. It's, it's a book that he wrote. Uh, here, here's the problem. When smart men think that they can render an expert opinion on something they have never experienced. Uh, in other words, um, I haven't experienced this, therefore it does not exist, and I will build a whole defense around it. This is why this does not exist today. Um, it's a cessationist view, if you want the term. Um, the problem, y'all, is this. It goes in the face of 2,000 years of evidence to the contrary that God is still moving powerfully, supernaturally. The gifts are still in operation all around this globe. Just because you have not experienced this does not mean that it does not exist today. I'm preaching some good stuff here today. <laughs> so, it, for example... If two textbooks are written on a subject and one has the, the one author has experience and the other doesn't, which one would you choose to read? I don't want somebody's hypothetical on a subject. I want to know somebody who has gone through some stuff. Say, so I'm going to listen to this guy. Tell me about your experience. I also want, I want facts. I want evidence. I, I'm not putting my brain aside just because you've been through something. But I want to hear from you. Right? So, um, I hope you're comfortable. Would you now stand? And uh, we're going to read a passage of Scripture. The looks on your faces when I asked you to stand. My goodness. Oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> Y'all need to repent, man, next Sunday night. Okay, so we're, <laughs> we're going to read Acts t chapter 2. Um, verses 1 through 13, and we just stand in honor of God's word. Um, so on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, say suddenly. suddenly. Ooh, I like the suddenlies of God. I want some suddenlies around here. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a, uh, the roaring of a mighty windstorm. We know what that sounds like around here, don't we? Yes. Iowa, man, come on. Um, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Say filled. Yeah, there's some good words tucked in here. Verse 3, then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Um, it wasn't literal fire, like being singed and like, you know, anybody smell burnt hair? It's not good. It's not good. Um, so <laughs> then, I don't know, right? This is how my brain works. So you're here, I don't know. But um, um, uh, so, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. Uh, technically tongues, uh, as, the Spirit, uh, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At, the time, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard this, uh, the loud noise, everyone came running. What's going on? And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? Boy, I wish we'd have God do some stuff that just sort of messed with people. How can this be? What's going on? I want some of that stuff. Amen. Come on. Okay. Um, how can this be, they exclaimed. These uh, people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our native languages. Here we are. Oh, here we are speaking Bible names. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, e and Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome. <clears throat> excuse me, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Whew, I did all right. Okay. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. This is a miracle. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. Verse 13. There's always some. Sometimes they go to church. Ooh, ooh, I, didn't, I don't know about that. Um, but others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. 
Can I just tell you that verse 13 puts, the Bible puts these people in a negative light and that you might want to avoid <clears throat> people that are negative and just have nothing but criticism to say? Let's pray. So Jesus, we welcome you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it challenges us. It's a double-edged sword that sometimes cuts. Lord, help it to cut us. Help us to get rid of, um, God, just strongholds in our thinking where we would put you in a box and we say, nope, nope, don't want that. God, I pray that our heart and every heart in this place and everyone watching online, that the heart of the people is, Lord, if it's from you, I want it. Give me everything you've got. I want it. Help me to eagerly desire, as Paul says, spiritual gifts, especially in these times where people need the power of God to show up with, to bring hope, to bring freedom. Holy Spirit, come. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to speak some more on this passage next week on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but today I want to do a bit of a topical look at the gift of tongues. And you might just hear some new things. Um, so Acts 2.4 Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So this says languages. Here's actually tongues, literally tongues. The Greek word here is glossa. Um, glossa. So, uh, so the study of speaking in tongues is called glossolalia, uh, which is literally tongue talking. Lalia is the talking, the speaking. So tongue talking, and we'll get to those other terms in a minute. Uh, so, uh, but that's the, that's the Greek term, that's the area of this study, and, and so, uh, so in Acts 2, 7 through 8, we read this, they were completely amazed, how can this be, they exclaimed, the people are all from Galilee, yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages, so there's a lot going on in this passage, this is truly a momentous time in all of history, and, and I want to kind of build that uh, with you a little bit. Um, so we're going to go all the way back to Genesis. Sometimes you need to go all the way back to the beginning because you've got some baggage that you need to understand and get rid of before you can step into something new. Amen. Hashtag counseled. I'm sorry, this is this thing. But, um, so we're going to go back to Genesis 11. Um, and so in verses 1 through 9, I'm not going to read it all, but after the fall, this is after the fall from Eden, this is after the flood, um, the men gathered together to try and form a great tower and a great city. Anybody heard of the Tower of Babel? Okay. And so they stated their purpose for building this tower in, in, in verse 4 of Genesis 11. They said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. The sin of Babel was that it was done in the pride of man. It's not wrong to build cities. It's not wrong to work together on a project. The, the sin was that it was done in pride, and it was also defying the command given by God after the flood to disperse and fill the earth. They wanted to gather, make their name great, and reach the heavens. And it's also believed uh, to be an attempt to copy what was lost at Eden. Jewish rabbis believe that the Garden of God uh, is believed to have been at the top of a great mountain where heaven overlapped earth. And so they're trying to recreate that. And, and so uh, Nimrod, who was the leader, was, was really echoing Satan's um, pride, saying, I will ascend, I will be like the Most High. Uh, in Josephus' Antiquities, it states this, Nimrod also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. For that, for that, he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach. Didn't God promise he would never do that again and set the rainbow in the sky as a covenant sign? But this is Nimrod taking measures on his own, didn't believe God, and it was rooted in pride. And it also says... And that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. What is done and built in pride will come crashing down. 
In fact, it won't just happen. It will be God opposing you directly. God opposes the proud. You do not want to be opposed by God. You will lose. God opposes the proud, but he lifts up what? The humble. And so God came down and struck them with confusion. Genesis 11, 7 and 8. God said, come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. And they won't, then they won't be able to understand each other. <clears throat> In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. How many know it's tough to finish a project when everybody's speaking a different language? What you, would you say? This is impossible. I'm done. Right? Can you imagine it? And it doesn't give a whole lot of detail. It just says all of a sudden people started speaking different languages and they gathered together in groups based on those common spoken languages and then they departed based on those languages. God confused them, separated them, and scattered them. That's what happens when a people operate in pride. And there's a lesson for the church here, too. The unity of the Spirit is evidenced when a church is in harmony, harmony speaking the same language. You know, the church, you know, the unity of the Spirit is evidenced when there's not discord within the church with different objectives, different goals, different ideals, all colliding off each other. That's not a sign of God's presence. There's unity. Not that people can't disagree and all of that. Not, nobody's saying that. But when there is a collision of different values, objectives, goals, that is like people are speaking different languages and nothing gets done. How we doing? How we doing? Okay. We good. Okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do this. Yeah, so... That's why we have core values around here. That's why we have a missional focus. That's why we don't, uh, you know, we don't give regard to personal preferences around here about how to do church. We do it based on mission, not whether you like this particular car carpet color or, you know, my, my chair is a little stiff. Can I get a pillow? You know, or like, I don't like this music. Can you just do, do my favorite music? We don't do that around here. That's not why we're here. We're here to reach people for Jesus. And we're here to see more of what happened last Sunday happen some more. Yes. I feel like I need to flex on that a little bit. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't even know what's happening right now. But, <laughs> but it's like I want to body slam another baptism. I'm gonna, CJ, is he here? I don't know. He's not here. I can't do it again. But. <laughs> so uh, the... Uh, and, you know, what are our values, by the way? It's pretty simple. We keep things simple. We kiss it. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, found people, find people. Save people, serve people. God's will is growth. You can't outgive God. You can't do life alone. And faith is spelled R-I-S-K. That's what we're rallying around are those statements. Okay. So why am I, why am I talking about Babel. You ever hear the phrase, what are you even babbling about? This is where that's from. Or, or everyone's just babbling. What's that, what's that mean? It's, it's talking about discord. It's talking about people with different objectives. There's a, there's a discord rather than a harmony to what's being said. And they're just, they're just many words, but nothing good is being said. Like a lot of preachers. No, no, I can't say that. Um, um, you, you want something to be said, and it needs to be in harmony with this. Or it's just babbling. There's religious babbling. I, I'm not here for that. Uh, and so, there, it, you know, babbling, it's discord. There's no unity of language. There's no unity of focus. There's a lack of understanding. So, so critics of the gift of tongues 
use terms like gibberish or people just babbling nonsense. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so let me tell you what God did on the day of Pentecost in relation to this gift. Jesus came, remember Babel? Jesus came to reverse the curse. Yes. That's what he does. He breaks the power of those curses and people find freedom. So he came and he reversed the curse. He came to break the chains of the curse of sin. And so as Holy Spirit came and all of them were baptized in his presence, the gift of tongues was given. And it's not that he made one single language from many, but rather in his presence and by his power, all the people were saying all the same things supernaturally in different languages. I need you to get that because this is a really cool thing. Yes. You know, God cursed and dispersed before and everybody speaking different languages and nobody understood anything. But those same languages still existed at this time. But in his presence, God gave unity and focus and everybody understood what was being said because it was magnifying God and it was a supernatural gift. He reversed the curse. Yes. So where man gathered in unity at Babel with their own pride to mock God and were thus cursed and dispersed, the Holy Spirit now gathered and empowered, gave, giving them unity once again as one people in Him. That's the key. It's in Him. Speaking the wonders of God by His strength. Do you know that people all around this globe right now and, and all throughout, you know, different time zones, of course, but they're gathered together with thousands of other believers speaking thousands of different languages and dialects, and they are singing and proclaiming the goodness of God. Do you know that that's happening all around the world? Do you know that it all started at the day of Pentecost? where God broke the language barrier and where there was a, an empowerment to commission, because this is all for a purpose, right? The Great Commission was given. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem for the power. The power comes. They start speaking in tongues, different languages, and there's, a, there's an empowerment, there's an anointing that happened so that then the whole world was turned upside down. Yes. Woo, that's good stuff. We need more of that power today is what I'm saying. It all started at this moment with this specific gift. God was undoing the curse so that Jesus could be proclaimed in every language and the great commission fulfilled. Acts 2.8, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native tongues. Do you know that there are different types of tongues? Well, I'm here to tell you there are. And there are also different purposes for those tongues. So, um, you remember the whole thing about uh, glossolalia? Glossolalia? Um, what we see here in this gift is recognizable languages. Okay? It is a foreign language supernaturally given to believers in order that the native speakers of those languages would be able to understand. This is a particular type of this gift of, of, of tongues. So God gives this gift, it's actually a different language, and people that speak that language natively understand what they're saying. But there are more types of tongues. Shall I go on? <laughs> okay, all right. So well, I'm going to anyway, so I don't know. Like, yo, I'm good, let's go. Um, <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 13.1, if I speak in the tongues of men and and it's by the grammar uses, tongues of men and tongues of angels, but have not love. I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Tongues of men, tongues of angels. Now put that, yeah, there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> so within glossolalia, tongue talking, the study of this, there are two different types of tongues mentioned scripturally. Remember, this is in here. So we have xenolalia, which xeno just means other. You know, xenobiology, xenophobic, you know, it just means other. Uh, fear of other would be the xenophobic. Uh, and then we have angelolalia. Angelo just means angels, so, you know, tongues of angels. So 
Um, that's just real fancy you know, Greek for what we just read. Um, but clearly there's a distinction scripturally in the types of tongues. Right? If I speak in tongues of men, it's tongues of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. So Paul's speaking about the imperative of love, but he's also speaking about two different types of tongues. Clearly there's a distinction. Don't believe me? Let's go on. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Well then, what shall, shall I do? I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit. And I will also sing in words I understand. Clearly, Paul is saying that while he is praying in the Spirit, he does not understand what he's saying. It got really quiet in here, didn't it? Is that just me? Okay. So clearly, Paul is saying that. And so there are, there are also times, of course, where he's praying with his mind and with his understanding, but... But critics and those who, who mock the things of God will often look at somebody who's praying in tongues uh, that they don't understand and call it gibberish or babble. But with thousands of languages in this world, not to mention whatever specifically uh, the tongues of angels encompasses, is it really inconceivable that, is what, is, that what is being prayed uh, is not a, a legitimate language? Um, you know, I'm going to show a video here in just a second, but, you know, I'm a German immigrant son, and so we, we've been to Germany a few times, and like, if you, how many of you ever heard German being spoken? Like, that's like harsh language, like, ich, I'm harsh, you know, I'm like, are you angry at me? What, you know, no, I'm telling you where the bathroom is, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so, I mean, there are all different kinds of, of languages, and they're so unique and so many different syllables and how to pronounce those syllables. And so, um, you know, there's a, um, <laughs> so maybe you've heard of German, but have you ever heard uh, the language of Kazakh being spoken for, in Kazakhstan? Mostly they speak Russian, but they have their native dialect, which is called Kazakh. This is, uh, what a video I'm going to show you is a, uh, a newscaster speaking in the Kazakh tongue, and I want you to remember how people sometimes mock people that are praying in the spirit, that's just gibberish, whatever, whatever, whatever. So let's go ahead and show that video. <laughs> That's right. Do you get my point? I do. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so the point is, that sounds like gibberish to me. Right? I mean, come on. I mean, I'm not being racist or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I'm just saying that, to me, that sounds like gibberish. Somebody praying in the Spirit, people who pray in tongues, it sounds like gibberish, but... Who are you to say that it's not actually a tongue somewhere? I mean, maybe it's tongue of angels. I don't know. But maybe it's actually language or dialect spoken somewhere on this earth, and you just don't happen to know it, but you're going to write it off as not being of God. So here's a question that I have and have had. Um, if when we're praying and we do not understand, why would we pray when we don't understand? Romans 8.26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us in this uh, version here, but prays for us uh, with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer. When we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit helps us. He empowers us. He prays through us. He, he helps us. We're engaging the will but it's also the Holy Spirit working together like this through, the, through just like how the Bible was written. There's an inspiration that happens. And so God works in, in communion with our spirits and we're praying. And we have to have faith yes. that God is doing what he promised he would do. Yes. And I, I'm going to tell you, as a new believer, this was hard for me. But after years, I'm not going to tell you how many years, but 
years of, 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 of praying and, and utilizing this gift, I have seen the difference. I have seen the, the promises. I've seen, I felt the encouragement. I, I've had, uh, you know, prophetic words that have come through this. I've, so, so it, it, you know, just like when you call upon Jesus for salvation and faith, everything that's from God is rooted in faith. And so we start by saying, well, it's in here, and, and, and Paul tells me I should probably do this thing or at least seek it, I don't know. And so I'm just going to start there, and then I'm going to start a journey of seeking and starting a journey of faith. And so how often? Um, how often should we do this, uh, you know, this gift and so on? Well, uh, 1 Corinthians 14.1 and by the way, if you really want to just dig in scripturally, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, like the church in Corinth, man, these people were crazy. Um, and so Paul's giving some real clear direction. They were like, you know, the old holy roller churches and like, you know, people swinging on the chandeliers and running around like, Whoa! you know, and just going <laughs> crazy. Um, that's kind of the, I mean, this was, and they were even messed up section, like there's a whole lot going on in this church. But Paul's loving on them, giving them instruction. And so we see as God is dealing with this problem, he gives some, some, some direction and some correction. But anyway, so 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And he is talking to a bunch of people that are crazy and out of control. But he's telling them earnestly. Desire the spiritual gifts. Guess, what he, guess who else he's telling that to since God's word is alive and for us? Uh. Yeah. Right answer. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So that word earnestly desire, that's, that's uh, zelo'o, which is worth the word we get zealous from. So uh, he's saying be zealous to pursue spiritual gifts. How many of you would describe your attitude towards the gifts of the spirit as being you, you being zealous for them, are you zealous for the pursuit of gifts in your life? Okay. I mean, it was, I just kind of want you to internally process that, but um, would you describe yourself as, as responding to this verse saying, I'm going to, I am earnestly desiring, I'm zealous for spiritual gifts in my life. And, and it's okay because a lot of you probably just haven't understood this, and it's just sort of this thing that's out there, and I don't really understand it. Um, that's why we're talking about this and focusing on it, because we need an empowered church in the day that we're living in. And I want you to have power in your personal prayer life and, and praying for your family and praying for what's going on in your life. But, um, but as far as how often, 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all y'all. Okay, he didn't have that y'all thing in the back. but um, So he's saying, listen, I'm, I do this all the time. And so where are we at? Okay. Okay, so I didn't know if I'd have enough time. So I have a couple things that I want to talk about that, that are really kind of uh, practical teaching kind of things. Real quick, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, so not only are there different types of tongues, but there's also different purposes for those tongues. What is it used for? Well, it's used in worship. Now, here's the thing, and I, can't, I don't have time to get into all the stuff, but as Paul is speaking to this church that's crazy, um, he's, he's giving them some direction. He's giving them some order for the service. And so he's saying, like, if you speak out in a tongue where it causes everybody to focus on you, it becomes the focus of the service, that's fine, but there needs to be an interpretation, okay? And he said, and also, there needs to be a limit of two, maybe three, he says. And so he's putting some limitations on this. Just in his concern is so that the whole city of Corinth doesn't think y'all are out of your minds. Nobody would ever think that, right? And so, um, and he's also giving direction because the plain speaking of the scripture and the gospel has to go forward. He's saying it's great. He's saying, man, it's great, and, and you should earnestly desire these things, but there needs to be an order to it. And so, but Paul's also saying, I use this in worship, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. 
So I pray with my spirit. I also pray with my mind. Also, I sing praise with my spirit. So it is perfectly acceptable for, to be praying and, and worshiping. Uh, somebody could be praying and worshiping in tongues. And you could do that at home. You could even do it here. I would say, you know, don't go crazy with it or super loud. I mean, if you're just, you know, where you become the distraction and the focus. But if you want to just, God, I just need you. And you just kind of, you just feel that, that, that pull towards just praying and worshiping in tongues. That's okay. That's okay for somebody to be worshiping in, in that type of thing. Um, and so... Um, it's also used as a personal prayer language. We already read this, but Romans 8, 26, where the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Um, Jude 20 is actually a great verse. Um, it says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. So how many of you have struggled with, you don't have to answer, with fear, anxiety, depression, uh, feeling just darkness, um, especially, gosh, the last couple of years, right? Um, Jude 20 is giving us something that is a great power tool in the church that the devil wants to keep you separate from. And this is something where you're on your own and you can just start to pray in the Spirit. And, you know, there's times uh, um, I, I go away every year around January for just a, a spiritual retreat. And that's where I just say, try and get God's heart for the year and do some sermon planning and stuff like that. Um, but this last time I spent, gosh, it must have been a solid hour on the balcony just praying in tongues. And like I just, I had the time, I did, you know, I was alone, I didn't have phone calls going off or different things or, you know, all the distractions that happened. So I'm like, I'm just going to do this. Man, by the end of that hour, I was ready to charge hell with a squirt gun, man. <laughs> I mean, I just was like, let's go! And it was just so encouraging and edify, which means build up. You can take your own spiritual health and mental well-being into your hands. And you can coach yourself, but you can also utilize this gift that God gives. And you can build yourself up. You ever feel overwhelmed? Ever feel like you don't know how to pray? Man, the gift of tongues is a wonderful gift. It's a wonderful gift, and, and, and the thing that disturbs me so much is that because of mi you know, misunderstanding and misteaching, uh, it's kind of seen as this negative thing, and, it, and it's, it, okay, here's the thing. The word for spiritual gifts, there's two words used, pneumatica and charismata. And the word charismata in, in, in particular is, is a combination of two Greek words. Charis, which is grace. It's a grace. And mata, gift. It's a grace gift. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to prove yourself to God. It's something that he gives. You can't earn salvation. You can't earn anything that God wants to give you. Amen. You just seek it. It's a grace gift. You know, or you don't understand what's going on in my life. God's not going to do this for me. God's not going to fill me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're acting like you're trying to earn what God wants to give. You can never do that. It's a grace gift. Just receive it from your Father who loves you and wants to equip you, wants to give you gifts. Okay. Couple, two more things and I'm done. Promise. Okay, um, and also, uh, this gift can be used in missions. I've heard stories where missionaries were on the field and going into uh, an unknown people in an unknown tongue, and um, in one particular instance, I remember the missionary turned, or the, the guide, the interpreter, who didn't know the language of the people, and, you know, I know they're skeptics, but turned and said to the missionary, God just gave me the language for these people. Now, I need help right? I need Jesus in those moments because I'd be like, jury did, <laughs> you know? But I wouldn't say it out, hello, Jesus on the main line? <laughs> Call him up, tell him what you want. Hello? Jesus calling? Tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up. 
Welcome to my ADD, everybody. <laughs> it's, it's your fault. I tell you to silence those ringers. Then you get the, the crazy show. Anyway, so the, the, the guy turns and says, God just gave me this, uh, this, this people's language. And so I'd be like, you know, and I'd follow him like, okay, we'll see. Uh, and so, but God did, and those people were able to hear and, and responded to the gospel. So, uh, and that's that xenolalic, that's that giving another language to somebody in order that the hearer can then understand. So that's that xenolalic, uh, it's tongues that would be understood by them. Uh, and then finally, uh, tongues can be used to give encouraging messages to the gathered church. Uh, it has to be interpreted, as I mentioned but, and there's a limit, like I, like I mentioned, but, um, but 1 Corinthians 14, 27, if any speak a tongue, this is in the context of a service, um, let the, and not a prayer service, by the way. If we have a prayer service, you can go for it, because that's the focus. That's why we're here, right? You can go all out. But here on a Sunday morning, where we're focused on the gospel and, and reaching those uh, in, in discipleship and all that, um, there, there's limitations to it, so... Uh, speaking in tongue, let there be only two or most three, and each in turn, not over each other, and let somebody interpret. So, there's a thing, and I could, gosh, I could do a whole series on, on this gift, and, and, and how it's a good thing, and it's how it's something we should seek, and how it's something we should be open to, and how it's not the Holy Spirit possessing somebody. There's an act of will that's engaged as if God is doing something, and it's this combination. And I, there's, there's all kinds of things I could talk about, but I don't want to overwhelm, and we only have so much time, uh, right? Because I could, no, okay, I said it'd be done. Um, so, and, and I'm, there's probably more questions, and that's great, uh, but if it stimulates you to say, you know what, I want to look into this a little bit more. Um, that's a great thing too. So what I want to do is we're going to close and we're going to pray. And next Sunday we're going to um, focus a little bit more on the the day of Pentecost in a uh, broader way. We just focused on one thing uh, about that today. But um, so I, I want us to you know, focus on that a little more, understand a little more what happens and what this baptism of the Holy Spirit thing is all about. Um, so we're going to focus on that. Like I said, uh, but today. We're going to just close. And so would you bow your heads with me, if you would, and and close your eyes? Um, I I know it's kind of heavy on content today, and this is probably more of a teaching Sunday. But I never know what God is doing because we gather together on Tuesday nights and we pray. That chair you're seated in today, we've prayed that over that chair because we knew you were going to be seated there. So we don't know. God may be speaking to you. God may be saying something to you. So I want to be sensitive to that because I don't want to put limitations on it. So if the Holy Spirit is here today and speaking to you and you saying, you know, you don't really know Jesus as Lord and Savior, everything starts there. The relationship, the foundation, the the, 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 the transforming experience that happens to every believer by the Holy Spirit where we become born again. If you're here today and that's you and you say, you know what? I want to place my trust in Jesus. I don't know about all this other stuff you're talking about, but, but I do know I need Jesus. If that's you, would you shoot your hand up real quick, and then you can put it right back down. We just want to pray for you real quick. Thank you. Others, quickly, up and then down. Just need Jesus. Just, just need a, a real experience, a real touch from Jesus. One more second, up and then down. Thank you. Secondly, I want to pray for those that are here and just struggling, uh, just struggling with life, and there's a lot of pressure right now, and there's a lot of things going on. You just say, you know what, God knows what it is, but I just know I need his help. If that's you, would you shoot your hand up? Say, I just need a touch from the Lord. I just need help. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful that you don't stand at a cosmic distance just watching You bridge the gap. You're with us. Jesus said it's better that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. And we know that it's because his presence fills us. So, Lord, I pray for those that raise their hands to to trust you with salvation, a genuine relationship with you. Would you come right now by your Holy Spirit and empower and change 
their heart. Make them what the Bible calls born again. Make them what Jesus was referring to. We believe, Jesus, that you died, rose again, and ascended to heaven. We believe that you are our Lord and Savior. We submit to your Lordship. Would you take over? We're declaring that you're the boss and we're not. We humble ourselves. Take over, Lord. And Father, I also pray for encouragement this morning. God, for those that are struggling. God, this world is hard right now. But God, I believe that you give a special grace for us to live and to thrive in this moment, in this time in history. God, I pray by your spirit, encourage their hearts. Give them answers. God, give them breakthrough. Open doors that no man can shut. Uh, if it's your will, and close all the rest of them. We're just asking for breakthrough moments. We ask that you bring the prodigals home. God, we're asking for favor upon your people, protection. We're asking for a hedge about your people. Show the distinction that there is when being the people of God. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week and a great holiday.